It is about how you build advocacy, how you build loyalty, and how you know build a tribe together that want to all go go hunting together. Episode ninety nine. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host Ryan Willard, and this week. I had Adam Scott back onto the show because he was so brilliant last time and he's got such an incredible wealth of knowledge and expertise, particularly in this particular conversation where we're talking about remote working and actually how to create and choreograph successful conversations with teams and clients that may be located around the world. So for many of us, the kind of forced virtual studio setup, which has been encouraged by the COVID-19, um, has kind of come rather rapidly or quickly or unexpectedly, uh, whereas Adam has actually been working like this for many, many years. And his experience being the executive creative director and founder of Free State um, he has been working with many large corporate companies on their brand, on their brand experience, on their master planning experiences through these kind of virtual modes of communication. So in this episode, Adam goes into a very clear breakdown of how he choreographs these conversations, how he facilitates leadership, how he facilitates participation so nobody is left out and how he presents ideas and how he takes people through a narrative journey and he goes into a step-by-step -step process of how he does that so it's really fascinating and a really useful lesson um, for all sorts of creative professionals so sit back and relax and enjoy the brilliant Adam Scott so massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK discovery call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Adam, welcome once again to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, sir. Thanks for inviting me back. Great to have you. Obviously, we're in uh, slightly different circumstances to our last conversation. The world has changed and you know, much of the nature of this, today's conversation is going to be about um, virtual conversations and how we choreograph them and how to effectively choreograph them to have powerful presentations and conversations. So obviously, for many architects, working online and using Zoom as a format is quite new, but you've been working for many, many years internationally with clients and video conferencing and remote conversations are actually part of your bread and butter. You've been doing it for quite a long time. Yeah, that's right. I mean, one of the really annoying things about our business is, is, is some, most of the projects we won when we first began nearly 20 years ago were with Sony in Tokyo, or with Samsung in Seoul, and you know we we couldn't be with them all the time. So right from the very beginning, it became about enormous conference calls and early video conferences and ways that we could better build connections with people, even if we couldn't sort of be with them or, or see them. And I think one thing maybe we'll talk a bit about today is you know obviously my business. You know I'm interested in experience design, experience master planning, how you better curate and create experiences. And so, you know, it's a virtuous circle that if I can create a great experience within each interaction, 
we can more easily help our audience, our clients understand you know, what it would be like not just to work with us throughout the process, but what it would be like to then deliver a wonderful product at the end. So that's why we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about each one of these interactions. Got it. And so how, how do you do that? How, how do you choreograph these remote conversations? Is there an art to it? Yeah, well, I think there is a real art to it. And then uh, as you, you, you obviously, you, you, you gave me a bit of a warning. So I have prepared <laughs> a, uh, a diagram for you. Perfect. Uh, <clears throat> we can maybe, I'll send through and we can maybe kind of upload. And I thought I might talk through that a little bit. But fundamentally, what we have here is, I think the first bit is you see the arc going up and down. You see that? I right, think so that's the... Yeah. yeah. So the first bit we need to get our heads around is there needs to be a narrative arc. Now, I think the narrative arc, so Robert McKee wrote a brilliant book called Story in 1999. And he's like a legendary screenwriter. And he spoke about the highs and lows of how you begin with almost a moment of collision. You have an inciting incident and you get people's attention. So part of what we're going to talk about is the ebb and flow of the narrative arc. And so that we're not you know, always battering people with moments of collision, but nor are we being absolutely kind of plain and through the middle. We're understanding the, the sort of structure and the highs and lows. So that's one part of it. And then the other bit, can you see the more bow tie bit going on here too? Yes, in, in, yes, in the background. Yeah. yeah. So the other bit we're talking about here is also a purchase funnel. So we're keen from one end where we first, you know, start kind of building... Uh, awareness in our audience we want them you know we want it to be very broad very open very bold we then want to develop interest in our audience we fundamentally then want to lead to action so this process was developed by a guy with a great name called E. St. Elmo Lewis in the 1890s and it's, it's the purchase funnel or the sales funnel so what we want to do is we want to understand that in all of our conversations with our audience we're building this sort of intra attraction here. We want them to be very involved here. And then slowly we're building belonging, loyalty, so that there's a deeper and richer conversation. So I'm going to talk it through in terms of that kind of process. Perfect. That yes, perfect. Yes, that's, that's great. All right. So let's, if we then maybe, rather than having me jockeying for... Uh, yeah, for attention with my uh, stupid diagram, I'll just say at first, we're going to look at the first bit, which is collision, yeah, the beginning bit. And if you look at the bottom, you can see a little diagram of a little house with a notebook on it. So yeah. I think, so the first bit is, it's like, we're going to look at act one. And I think act one is all the things that happen before that remote conversation. And so what we often do is we'll send people notes, and I'm sure you all do this, which are beginning to sort of set the scene and the agenda of what's going to happen. But we'll always ask people to do a little bit of homework. And it won't be about reading a massive document. It definitely won't be about showing them what we're going to present. But it will be about thinking about some of the themes around what we're going to talk about. It might give an example of, you know, I just saw this Netflix documentary on explaining memory. Tell us, you know, what do you think about that? What have you seen around how we better get our audience to remember? Or you might have a book and you might say, you know, I don't know, this 1970s book, Pattern Language. There's a page in there we think is very relevant. You know, what book would you bring to this conversation? So you're starting to warm them up and you're starting to establish some shared talking points. And I think that's really, really important because it means that there already there's a spirit of co-authorship even before you've begun. So that would be the first point, that kind of act one piece of this mm. journey. Okay. Now, the next bit is, the second bit is this one of curiosity. Now, this is where we're actually beginning the conversation online, Zoom, Skype, yada, yada, whatever it is. And I think the first thing we would always do there is we're starting to ask people about their talking points. We're saying, well, what book did you find? What article did you find? What magazine did you find? And they might be going, well, there's this thing in Monocle Guide to Cities. And there's a piece there by, I don't know, Jan Gale about, uh, you know, first life. We love that. And so as your people are gathering in the meeting, 
you've got this lovely almost there's an agenda to it because you know you've looked ahead at what you want to get out of this meeting but what you've done is you've got the beginnings of something that everybody is sharing conversations and you're beginning to go ah oh, you know, Ryan you said this and Lucy you said that and George I love that so you're starting to draw people in and critically you're making sure everybody is on video you're making sure that you're, you're modeling good behavior. So you're using your hands so that not everybody is there, I don't know, playing solitaire or whatever they're doing. You're really starting to show, I suppose, the physicality of it. You know, you're being quite, um, you know, analog, even though you're clearly speaking through uh, the, you know, a device. So, so it's still quite a performance in a way. There's a, there's, a, there's a theatricality to it and being able to craft it like it were a you know like actual like an actual story yeah i think so and that's why this bit this second bit is called curiosity is that you know we're really trying to if we imagine this in terms of like the wizard of oz the, you know the second the first bit the collision is you know when you have the, the tornado and so you know we're really enjoying in that bit beforehand you know lots of random conversations and sort of building the energy but here with curiosity we need to start finding out more about the people in the room or like the Wizard of Oz, we need to get to know Dorothy and her three friends mm. before we go on this journey together. So that's, I think, the first thing. And also we might be picking out themes and we'll say, Ryan, well, it's very interesting you said that or George, you said that. So we're already beginning to note our role as a host whilst also giving everybody a bit of space. And does this work with... You know, is there a limit to how many people this can work with? Or do you, are there sort of maximum and minimum bands, if you like, of how many people can be on these calls for it to, to be impactful? Yeah, I think very much so. I mean, you know, even in our workshops, uh, workshops in the real world, you know, we never have more than 25 people in those. I think these, I, I always start to struggle beyond around nine tiles on the screen. You know, I, th I think that's getting, getting a little bit tricky because I really want to make sure in this act two curiosity that I've been able to name check everybody, everybody has been welcomed and everybody has been able to show their talking point. You know, not to necessarily talk a lot about it, but they are clearly welcomed into the space. Mm. And, 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 and around that number seems to work rather hard for us. It's it's interesting that you say that actually that um, there's you know, the act of welcoming and making sure everyone feels welcome because there can be a kind of anonymity about you know Zoom calls and digital conferencing where you just sort of you know you can kind of pop up or you you're there and you don't have your your camera on and how how do you also kind of get a sense to be able to gauge what people are are doing because obviously I, you know I know when I'm doing live public speaking. I love to be able to look at someone in the audience, make direct eye contact and speak as if I was directly speaking to them and just get a sense. How do you kind of recreate those types of connections? Yeah. Well, I think in that bit, there was the home, homework bit in Act One. You know, we've made, made a point of, you know, speaking to people about their talking points that they're bringing in. We're going to tell them a few things about what, we're, what we might present and some of the themes that are coming up. So we're constantly saying, well, Ryan, you know, you, you, we had that conversation early, didn't we? You'll see that coming up later. So we're always trying to stitch together this narrative arc. We're always trying to, you know, suggest that this is a much longer conversation than it is. So there's quite a lot of prep that goes into, you know, understanding each one of those individuals and know that some are a little shyer than others, mm. you know, some of them are gonna, you know, and some of them are going to talk too much so that we can almost then order it in a way that you might have someone who's you know, comfortable stepping forward as the first one, and then actually you don't follow with too many confident people. You can then move on to one or two shyer souls so that you're again beginning to curate that first welcoming space together. I think with this bit, almost the, the, the thing you need to kind of get across next is this next bit, which is the, the connection bit in the middle. And that's where everything kind of comes together. And that's fundamentally where you're going to be uh, you know, doing whatever this presentation is. This is where your audience is going to be, you know, hope, you know they're going to be quite passive. You're going to be quite active. And this is obviously the bit where you so easily lose everybody. Yeah. So in the same way that you were doing it before, you've got to keep on calling out, you know, Ryan this, George that, you remember I said that, so that they know that they're involved. 
And obviously sharing a screen can be ever so difficult here because they can't see you bobbing around. And, and you know, that is, so ideally you have a platform where you can still be in the screen whilst also sharing. Now, with this connection bit, it's ever so important, and I know you all know this, but you know, that structure of say what you're gonna say, say it again, you know, say it and then say it again, is so important, but actually, you know, with more nuances to that, is almost that, that, that way of thinking about the why, the how, and the what. You start off with talking about the why and the purpose. You remind everybody why they're there and what we're gonna get out of this. And in 20 minutes time, we're then gonna dig into this and workshop it together. You're making sure that everybody understands that this is the setup. You're then talking through the process of how you're gonna get there. You know, you actually, you know, there's a simple diagram that talks about the steps and then the what is, and here is the product, here is the idea, here is the, the building, here is the master plan, yada, yada, whatever it might be. I think too often, if I may say, architects often lead with the what, they lead with the product. Mm. Um, because they, they're so, you know, excited to be out there telling the story of what they've come up with and why it's important. Um, but often they lead too much with the product. So I think we need to always remember that let's you know, lead with that brief and lead with the, the big purpose and then follow through. And I think simply, in order to keep everybody on the straight and narrow, you need big page numbers there so that everybody can go, right, yeah, George, right, yeah, we're now on page three, you know, Ryan, yeah, let, let me just re return everybody to page four. You don't want too many words there, but bullet points are kind of can be great. And also, I'm really interested in questions on these pages mm -hmm. so that you might have a drawing and you say, this you might find is an important question about, I don't know, the longevity of this, or this is an important question about how long it will take to deliver or whatever. So that then you're giving them cues to dig into in the next stage, which is the more Q&A bit. If that makes sense. Yes. Um, and again, it's very pertinent that you say that you're leading with, you know, with, with questions and, and not going with the product straight away. Can you give us an example of what would be leading with the product straight away? Yeah, so um, I, I saw a, a, a competition entry the other day that was presented to me, and uh, it began with uh, the architects who were talking about uh, the facade, they were talking about the, 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 the envelope, uh, they were talking about the materials, they were talking about, and, and they were beautiful materials and wonderfully resolved, but actually for the, it was an airport project, for the airport, what they're most interested in is how this uh, new terminal is gonna better attract and involve its audience, how it will you know, better serve its airlines, and how almost you, you, know, you wanna build from the inside out. You wanna tell the story of how it's gonna beautifully encourage the flow of those millions of people. And then you can work your way out to what that may, might mean for the architecture and the master plan. You know, that's where the brief began, but the architect had gone into it uh, through the bit that they were most interested in, which wasn't actually what the client was most interested in. Yeah, now that, now that's really key because I see this quite a lot happening in the architectural industry and we talk about we talk you know the conversation about oh we must get better at learning to communicate value and this is a very key part of it is that communicating value is understanding what's of value to the clients to the other person not yeah. what's of value to us as architects and yeah. and we often and it's it's it sounds easy it sounds so easy to do but in mm -hmm. practice there are very strong kind of emotional connections to the building, to the choices that have been made and to those certain things that, that we want to talk about. And you, you can see it on websites as well when you go onto architects' websites and it's, you know, it is just pure architectural form. It's like details. It's not actually about the buildings or the houses or the lives of the people who are using them and how it's benefited them as such. We get it and it's a it's a really there's a lot of depth in that. Like there's a lot of psychological depth as well. How, how do you um, extrapolate or find out what, what is of value to your clients? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, you know, one of the first things is of course asking them 
And, and I know that sounds like a facetious answer, but the, you know, if we take the, an, an airport example, for, for instance, or, or I mean, any would work, but just because we've started on that tip, the, you know, it, yes, building a new terminal, it may well be a brief for a new terminal. It may well go very quickly into what is the you know, space budget plan for that particular building. But actually, the brief behind that, the purpose behind that at the business plan, most strategic board level, is that that airport, you know, it is about, you know, revenue and reputation. It is mm. about dealing with far more people and actually maybe trying to outcompete some of their competitors. So there's a whole story with a, you know, viciously important business agenda behind why this has been commissioned. And so I think to get into the vision behind the brief, I think is critical. To imagine you're sitting there, you know, with the board or with the ultimate decision maker, trying to understand, you know, what is most critical to them and what would make or break a project like this. And actually, you know, I find asking the client, you know, again, why this? Why, what's the big reason behind this? Why not this year? Why not that year? Why not, why, you know, why, why all, why get into that, I think is absolutely critical. So that's all we do. We just ask the question again and again and again, and then we play it back to them so that we make sure that every response we're putting forward, it is there at the beginning of the, 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 um, the, the presentation. Mm. And ideally, we'll have the client's name there. So, you know, if it's the CEO of the airport or if it's the head of marketing for the brand, we will have a quote from them at the very beginning to keep everybody on the straight and narrow so that we are there representing them. It is them have the authority and then we are there to supercharge their vision is how we always put it. Fantastic. Brilliant. And, and going back to your, your narrative structure after we've, yeah. you've, you've established the, where we're, where we at, we're at connection. We're right in the middle. So we're right in the middle. We've done our presentation. We have kind of, you know, told our story. Now we need to get into collaboration. And I think I would recommend that there is always a collaborative bit to any one of these kind of calls. Because in that way, you know, it's almost like it's kinesthetic learning, isn't it? You know, we've done some things that have been about the conversation. We've done some things where we've seen each other face to face. And maybe there's been a bit of writing there, a bit of talking here. There's been a lot of listening going on here. And now we're bringing it all together in a kinesthetic way. So this is the way that, you know, obviously, you know, learning happens. And it happens, you know, across, you know, our eyes, our ears, our mouths. You know, we've got to get it all going on here. And so what I'd say in that bit is you then, you know, coming out of this whole share screen thing and you're saying, so what do you think about this, Mr. X? You know, you're really drawing out the key points. And you might have, you know, there might be a very simple workshop going on. So for instance, in our work with Google recently, we had a wonderful graph that was from, uh, from great to shit. And all <laughs> we were doing is we were just taking digital post-it notes with each one of the points and going, all right, that one's higher, this one's lower, and everybody goes, no, no, this one should be here. It's either above the line or below the line, which is a simple SWOT analysis, really, about the strengths and weaknesses of what we're doing here. And I find that very, very useful because it helps, it helps with this spirit of co-authorship. And fundamentally, as long as I'm calling out people's names, and often I'll put a few ringers in there. So I might say, you know, Ryan, you know, I'm going to ask you this particular question at the end, or, and, and so that we can more easily warm everybody up. And, so, and then they can model the behavior I want to see in the next 15 minutes of this little workshop. And so that's good. Ah, right. Okay. And, and in terms of creating this, I love this idea of, of co-authorship and it's not just you kind of presenting something to somebody and then just waiting for responses um in terms of the collaboration what are the sorts of how do you invite people into collaboration how do you particularly if perhaps you've got a client who's naturally reserved or perhaps some of the decision makers might not be the most outspoken people how do you ensure that everybody's collaborating yeah it's very hard. I mean, obviously, a lot of what I'm doing here in all these steps is trying to warm everybody up. And so whether it's the conversation before we got online or, you know, asking them about these talking points or making sure that I've got a good feeling for some of their agenda and their interests. So I've got it all written up 
on the wall around me so that mm. I know that Ryan is interested in this and his concern, concerns are that. I know George is particularly interested in the money and really is struggling with this aspect of the vision. And whatever you do, never use the word brand, only use the word, I don't know, identity. So I've got lots and lots of sort of key talking points there to make sure I can more easily oh, draw them in. That's brilliant. You actually, you might actually have behind your screen things on the wall with words of interest of what each person is yes. fascinated by or interested in. And so you can actually see that whilst you're presenting. That's a really good idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're using words like curate and choreograph and direct, aren't we? And, and I, I really mean that. I mean, that, that, is, that is exactly what we're doing here. And it's okay, I don't mind telling people that too, because, you know, as we get to know them, you know, I, I'm saying, you know, you, you, George, I know that you're always interested in this and you struggle with this bit, but we're going to spend a bit of time on it. And I mm. think, you know, that, that seems to work very well because ultimately, I think, you know, you know whether you're in a business, my, my business or more, you know, or... or uh, or a more traditional architecture route, you know, that role of directing, of managing all these complicated inputs and outputs also demands that actually, you know, it is that bit about better aligning and guiding the group to be a more integrated design team. You know, you have a responsibility to do that. And I would say that I think, you know, architects are, are well versed at that. Mm. So I, yeah, so I'm definitely saying turn that up. I'm also saying, I suppose, within that, that, um, I mean, obviously there's lots and lots of different workshop tools. I try and with these ones, keep them as simple as humanly possible. So there isn't too much complication on the mirror board or whatever it might be that actually to be above the line or below the line, to be left or right, to be you know, more of this, less of that, quite simple stuff. Because the reason I'm doing that is I'm just keen to kind of gather some first responses because then the last bit in terms of the celebration bit when people are sort of back home or wherever it might be is I then say at the end we're going to arrange a call you know I want to speak to you personally about this you know in that way we're going to gather the detail you know we might have summed up that little board that we talked about in the collaboration bit but then we'll have lots of highlights and saying right George we want you to dig into this bit and Lucy I want you to tell me more about that. I love what you said there. So that then we're making sure that A, the conversation is continuing, but we're also making sure that we can really get into the richness of this thing that we weren't able to handle, you know, in the you know, mass uh, collaboration workshop thing. We can only do that in a more sort of one-to-one -one way. And so that's ever so important. Uh, uh, that's very, very interesting as well, actually. So the, so the art of following up with people is crucial as well to ensure that the, the dialogue is kind of continuing. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, that's why this, you know, the highs and lows of this narrative arc are so ever so important. In many ways, even though we're talking about this as if it might be, you know, a few days before, an hour and a half here, and a few days later, in many ways, this is also a diagram of the whole campaign. It could be the whole year. It could be a relationship across years. And actually, what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep it going because obviously great businesses are not necessarily built on great projects. They're built on great relationships. Yes. And so that's why this last bit of going and I'll phone you up and we'll go through it separately. And it's almost like that bit often, I'm sure you have this when we're allowed out that often the best conversations happen in the corridor or the lift after the actual meeting. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a really interesting point because you know, for me doing the podcasts, um, you know, my favorite part of the podcast is always the conversation before and the conversation at the end. And often the conversation at the end when we stop recording is like, ah, and, <laughs> and then we have this informal chat and it's a lot more, you know, you're not, you're not presenting anything anymore. There's space for you to be more back and forth and all sorts of wonderful things happen. And, and I, you know, over the last few months, I've been like, well, how can I, how can you recreate that online? Because online can be a bit on off. Like everyone, yeah. everyone comes and it, it, you lose the sort of that natural relationship. So you're saying by actually um, following up with people and actually separating and having the one-on-ones, that kind of yeah. recreates that. 
Yeah, very much so. And so I really gold plate that, I think. And because, you know, a lot of what I'm talking about is co-authorship. So, you know, mm. therefore, I'm saying, right, okay, fellow authors, I'll speak to you on Tuesday and you on Wednesday and you on Thursday. And I think, you know, another important bit of this is that one thing I will often do in these calls and, and all the team do is that we will then be very visibly writing notes as we go along and either on a piece of paper in an analog way or on the screen but I, I, I quite like the piece of paper bit because then I can hold it up and I can say right you know you know you know Ryan I thought that was really interesting you said that I'm going to speak to you about that when I see you on Thursday. And then I'm like, underline it. So there's no, they can't get out of that. You know, we've all noted that that's been said and that was useful or that's a point of contention. And so you're almost, you're trying to sort of, you know, almost create an artifact around that piece of information. And I think that's ever so important. I mean, in the real world, you know, I'll often do that when I'll get people, you know, if they like something to sign it or if there's a drawing, I'll say, right, you know, I want you all to, you've all agreed on that. Let's all sign that together. So we're just trying to sort of build these artifacts together. I love it. I love it. Um, we were chatting um, previously uh, when we had our phone conversation about, you know, I was saying about how Rory Sutherland was, was telling me there's, there's this kind of, you know, when you go and travel somewhere to somewhere to somebody, that there's often there has been in the past anyway a culture of you know I've given something to you. I've I'm sh I'm showing how committed I am to this project to you being a client because I've I've travelled from London to LA and you know we've we've paid for the expense for the hotel. There's something about that either being accepted as a, as as a generous act. How do we? Is that, a, is that a real thing? And how does that get recreated in the virtual environment? Yeah. So I think, I mean, that, I mean, Rory, I mean, you know, he, he, he knows this better than anybody. Uh, and I think I would say that, I, I, well, I, I personally wouldn't do that because I think that to be a, you know, to, to be a specialist, to be, uh, you know, famous and well-known for what you do, your you, your positioning is so unique and so clear that actually you wouldn't you're not going to them and giving up you know giving up all that time on a whim you know all of a sudden you've done that and you 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 you, you know you're showing how you know sort of fantastic sort of subservient you are that you go my God we're going to put in all this money and all this time just to have a cup of coffee with you is is a massive thing. I mean, that's the sort of old school world of advertising. <laughs> what I'm saying here is that actually a lot of those bits that we're doing in this early act one piece is that we are building the relationship there. We're being generous by suggesting, you know, here are some things you should read and, and here are some you know, articles you should look at and here are some events you should go to. And so you've been building that up and up and up and up over time. So you've still led with generosity but yeah. the generosity that's much more linked to your expertise and one that you're more in control of rather than, uh, you know, a few thousand pounds on a flight. So I also, I mean, another wonderful character that you and I have spoken about before is, who's told me about this, is a guy called Blair Enns. Yeah. And Blair wrote this wonderful book called Win Without Pitching. And I, I thoroughly recommend it to your audience. And it's about how... You should, your, your positioning should be so unique that you're never pitching for work because why would you? Because people come to you because you're so specific. And so he helps you really get your head around uh, yeah, the uniqueness of that offer and how you position yourselves so that clients are coming to you. And if there is a pitch, how you more easily queer that pitch in a way that's about your better relationship rather than the fact that you might be a bit cheaper. And I think that is, it's, it's well worth reading. And that, yes, and that, that's really interesting. It's kind of dismantling the, 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 the kind of the neediness almost actually when we, when we're kind of trying to do too much for a client or, you know, chase it. If we're the ones who are pursuing the client, um, it's a, it doesn't create parity. No, no, there's no, there's no sort of, and, and no control in that. I, I think also what I'd say is often, I think when architects present, 
they're so <clears throat> you know overjoyed to be out and to be out to, to tell their story to celebrate all the hard work they've done and i'm sure you've all been in presentations like this i went to one not so long ago at shell and this this interior designer i mean she was brilliant uh, but we had 90 minutes for the meeting and literally she spoke for 82 minutes um, and used up all of the space, all of the room, because she was so desperate to tell everybody about all her wonderful ideas, and they were wonderful. But sadly, because she only left eight minutes for a discussion and had battered her, her audience, they were in no, they didn't want to commission that relationship at all, because fundamentally, you know, so much of what we're talking about here is not necessarily buying a product or buying a service, it's, you know, it's investing in a relationship. And therefore, you need to, it's clear that you need, you know, generosity and gratitude are fundamental pillars of this relationship. And I think, you know, we need to remember that as we give space to our audience and space to our co-authors within this. Mm. Yes, no, very, very much so. Um, I, that, I think that's, that's really wonderful, the way that you've kind of described that narrative arc through these conversations. Um, do you find, how do you then, when you're presenting in person, do you change this arc? Is it different? And do you, and do you still present in person? Yeah, well, yes. And, and I, I, gosh, I really enjoy that. And I'm looking forward to getting back into that because really, um, you know, because I mean, only one bit of this thing is actually the bit when one broadcasts, everything else is very conversational. And so uh, in everything we do in, in the live world, you know, we try and make it that it isn't um, you know, a broadcast mentality of one to many. It's very much a dialogue built with the audience and where it isn't so much, you know, that everybody has a, a role in producing and generating and making it better and bigger than the sum of its parts. And so, yes, I do do this structure because it keeps me honest and make sure that I lead with generosity, I end with gratitude, and I give lots of space to, you know, to everybody to, to get involved. And so, yeah, it's, I found it ever so useful. In many ways, I think that, you know, whether it's from, you know, Beowulf to Star Wars to The Wizard of Oz, you know, a narrative arc where you have a clear beginning, middle, and end, and you're fundamentally ending with something that is transformative, where everybody can see the value of what you've created together and that it is better because of it, I think is the only game in town. So mm. I would fundamentally, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously stories are how us humans have, it's the way we've you know, helped each other imagine the future for tens of thousands of years. So we should really use it. It's ever so useful. No, it, and it's, it's, it's something that we forget how powerful it is. And particularly when I, you know, when I'm talking about marketing and sales and the wider conversation of communicating in business stories, every single time are the most powerful way to create, um, an image of something. They're the most powerful way to capture people's attention, to have people brought along with you. And it's an, and it's an art. It's a real it's a real craft and, it's, and again one that architects are actually we are trained in doing it yeah yeah very much so and, and i think i mean it's funny isn't it that so often you know the debate around you know architects get very worried about you know word marketing and retail and sales and you know it all seems so dirty where actually fundamentally you know this is you know it's how you build those relationships and it, it is fundamental to everything we do. And I think you know, all I'm talking about here, whether it's the narrative arc of this or it's the sales funnel of this, it is about how you build advocacy, how you build loyalty and how you know, build a tribe together that want to all go, go hunting together. And that's why, yeah, learning about, I think the structure of storytelling, I think is absolutely important, vital, because I think too often we, 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 we think that the story bit is separate to maybe some of the other bits, and so the story bit might be the vision, and then I'm going to talk about I don't know, the tactics, where I think that's all wrong. I think story, the story needs to be fundamentally through the whole endeavour, because it's a story of how your users, your audience, your kind of... Uh, you know, the, the, your fellow humans are going to take part. And I think that 
you know, we've got to we've got to kind of keep that element. I would also say the other bit about the story bit is that I think that you know a lot of what I'm talking about here demands rehearsal. That mm. actually we can't idly think that uh, you know. And now here's the story bit, and now here's the spreadsheet, and now here's the kind of follow through on 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 the price. It all needs to be held together and well rehearsed and then also, you know, and, and well understood in terms of how all of the people on these calls are going to take part in this story and are an ensemble cast rather than you as the lead, the protagonist and everybody else as your roadies. It's not that. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Adam, thank you so much. I think that's been a, a real masterclass in being able to craft narratives and being able to choreograph your, your these Zoom conversations and our remote conversations with with large clients. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome, sir. And I think you know this this process. You know, whatever you're doing, whether you're you know when you're we're all out there in the real world making presentations, or we're doing lectures, or we're thinking about our relationship with our clients. You know, or you know how we then draw in our, our users and our audience into a more collaborative process. I would really recommend this to you. But it's lovely to have the opportunity. Well, uh, on that, actually, does this, do you recommend communicating like this internally? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. There's a, again, it's a virtuous circle. So as we communicate with our, our, our teams, we, we, we will often set things up in this way. And also when we're talking about workshops with, um, you know, with, with end users, where we're working with the community and uh, drawing people into, you know, often, you know, you know, quite a complicated story, we'll, we'll use this same way to, to warm up, you know, we'll sometimes have 50 to 100 people who will be part of a, you know, a community consultation and we'll use a similar structure. So I've found it works at every scale. I even did, a, you know, even my kids' children's parties, we, we break it down in terms of all of these elements so that fundamentally when we get to that point of celebration, we're all celebrating together. But that's another podcast. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. It's a pleasure, sir. Thank you, Ryan. Speak to you soon. Bye. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.